Okay, so uh, what we are going to talk about today is microbial symbiosis and animal speciation. And I want to start with a little bit of history and maybe involve you guys in the history. I think if I said, who's this, you'd all know. Of course, Darwin wrote The Origin of Species in 1859. Um, it was largely a theory based on observations in the animal and plant world. I'm not even sure if he knew about microbes, and certainly they weren't incorporated in any way into the foundation of evolutionary biology. This next person may look familiar to you. Uh, can anybody guess who it is? Just raise your hand. Yeah, we got a shot down there. Go for it. That is Ernest Haeckel. Great. So extra candy. Uh, right. So this is uh, not too many years later where Haeckel gives us his general tree of life. Interesting to note that the eukaryotes still take precedent here and they represent the crown groups of uh, this visionary tree. Right. So protists, animals and plants represent the majority of diversity. And if you were to ask yourselves, where's the bacteria? The bacteria are down here in a name called Monera at the base of the tree, and basically nothing is known about it, right? Let's march forward to one more person. This is going to be a little bit more difficult. Who is this? this is the microbiologists are going to know possibly who this is more than anybody else. So this is Robert Koch, okay? Robert Koch developed the germ theory of disease in the 1870s and 1880s with some experimentation. And the reason that it's good to put this uh, uh, history in here is because essentially germs were thought of as pathogens once we had the germ theory of disease. Um, very little integration going on into the rest of biology with the exception of immune reactions to the pathogens. It's not until, at least as far as I can tell, 1927 when somebody steps forward and makes a claim about the role of bacteria in, in speciation and major evolutionary processes. And so this fellow is a professor at Colorado. His name is Ivan Wallen and wrote a, a not well-known book called Symbionticism in the Origin of Species in 1927. Um, and he he's actually deserves a lot of credit. He was the first to observe that mitochondria, by dividing by binary fission, are actually bacterial-derived. In fact, he went as far as to claim mitochondria are bacteria inside the cells of animals and plants and so forth. We often attribute this to Lynn Margulis, but in fact, Lynn actually credited Ivan Wallen's pioneering work in her development of the endosymbiosis theory. It was Ivan Wallen who first made the connection based on these uh, uh, division traits. And he writes something that uh, is sort of ahead of his time. It's a rather startling proposal that bacteria and the organisms which are popularly associated with disease may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. Um, he bases that claim because he suddenly has something that may soar, serve as the primordial soup or the building blocks of evolutionary change in his mind by discovering that there are bacteria inside eukaryotic cells. There were still many debates happening right now about what was the hereditary material and source of evolutionary change. And in fact, Ivan Wallen had great misfortune because in the same year he publishes this book and makes these remarkable discoveries make some claims that probably go too far. H.J. Uh, Muller publishes his Drosophila radiation genetics work showing that you can cause transmutability in flies and those uh, uh, mutations essentially map to the nuclear genome. And this is the start and uh, thrust of the modern synthesis, if you will, where genetics in the nuclear genome and variation in the nuclear genome get incorporated into Darwin's evolutionary theories. So we move from eukaryocentrism, arguably, uh, with Darwin, to nucleocentrism uh, with the modern synthesis. What else happens? Well, in 1937, Theodosius Dobzhansky publishes one of the most well-known books in evolutionary biology, Genetics in the Origin of Species. And I like to note that Dobzhansky actually probably caught a catch of Ivan Wallen's book and just swapped out symbiotism and put it with genetics, and they end up with the same titles. Sort of a curious observation. Um, ten years apart, again, Wallen's book sort of gets lost to history. Dobzhansky's uh, certainly does not. So what does the future hold for thinking about microorganisms in evolution and speciation in particular? And in fact, we go right to Dobzhansky's uh, uh, lab again for this. And so this is Dobzhansky in the middle, 
all of his graduate students surround him in this picture. And in fact, there's one graduate student who's the only female Dubzhansky ever had, and her name is Lee Ehrman. And she's likely to have published the first study of looking at microorganisms in Drosophila that cause reproductive isolation, barriers to interbreeding that serve as the source for speciation. And in this case, it was hybrid male sterility that followed Haldane's rule, which is when one sex is sterile or inviolable, it tends to be the heterogametic sex, and that's, of course, males in Drosophila. And so she was able to show this by antibiotically curing the microorganisms out of the testes of these Drosophila flies, and she could rescue now the male sterility of her Haldane's rule that was underlying the, these early incipient speciation events in Drosophila polystorum. Not much happens after her work. In fact, I think the next uh, person to step in, really, is Lynn Margulis, who's credited for advocating for roles of symbiosis and adaptation and speciation, but she never did any work on the topic of symbionts and speciation herself. Okay? She was a major advocate in writing, basically by making observations that if symbionts cause adaptations for their animal and plant hosts, they're likely to play a role in speciation. But the field lays relatively dormant. But the genetics of speciation moves on with great vigor. And so this is a classic study done by Alan Orr and Jerry Coyne. It's actually a follow-up study to an earlier study of theirs, um, published in 1997, where they're looking at the correlation of genetic distance between Drosophila species and the amount of reproductive isolation that occurs in those species with zero meaning no reproductive isolation, so complete interbreeding, and one being complete reproductive isolation, or essentially speciation, where these species no longer interbreed. Each data point is a species pair. Right? So the important point here is they find this positive correlation between genetic distance and total reproductive isolation, which is what you would expect if, as the evolutionary divergence clicks on through time, you accumulate roughly a, a, a degree of reproductive isolation that associates with that genetic divergence. Okay. More to the modern era, we have now a, a large effort in identifying speciation genes in the evolutionary genetics community. This was a sort of, this is actually a now outdated publication or review of the types of speciation genes that have been documented in both plants and animals and their relative functions. Not a lot of talk about symbionts in this process yet, and in fact. Uh, there are a couple quotes that I saw in 2013 that were interesting to me uh, because they really reflected this, I think, this emphasis on looking at genes that cause speciation rather than microbes, right? So I know of very few cases in which endosymbionts cause speciation and a ton of cases in which changes in host genes do and in which those genes have been mapped. So taking the breadth of evidence for the genetics of speciation and saying this is the major way in which we get species. Or I don't think we have any evidence yet that there's been speciation caused by microbes. I'm not willing to go that far yet. So this was a little surprising to me because we have been studying uh, this very topic in Nisonia uh, for a couple decades now. And these are tiny parasitic wasps. They parasitize flies like horse flies or blow flies. They are not this big in reality and they certainly aren't this colorful. Um, they're about two millimeters in size, and they're metallic green, and I'll show you a picture of them in a second. Nasonia uh, is a uh, fantastic model, with the exception that you have to work with two organisms to work with it because it's a parasitoid wasp. So this is the host. This is the fly host, Sarcophagubulata. We rear these in our lab, and it's not very pretty. Uh, these are eggs of the fly, and these are carcass feeders. So we have to simulate a carcass with liver delivered from a meatpacking company to our lab every so often. Uh, those eggs develop into maggots. Maggots develop into pupa. And it's the pupal stage at which Nisonia will parasitize them uh, specifically. So here's a mated female Nisonia. She's now ovipositing into the puparium of this host. Uh, inside the host, just beneath the pupa casing, is the skin of the developing fly. These are the embryos that are deposited from the mother. Those embryos develop into larvae themselves, consuming the host from outside in. It's an ectoparasitic strategy, <laughs> leaving only the shell of the pupa behind. Everything else inside has been consumed. Uh, these will eventually pupate themselves and 
develop into adults. This is a generation time that takes about two weeks for Nisonia. We get about 40 offspring per host. Um, and moreover, the system has been developing into a really great genetic model. So this is the phylogeny of Nisonia, and you're gonna see a video of mating behavior, so try and redirect attention to where the red pointer goes, because I know it's gonna be hard to get it off of it. But we have two closely related species, which we're gonna call the younger species, Geralti and Longicornis, or G and L, and then a more distant species, Vitropenis, which diverged about a, a million years ago. We're gonna call Vitropenis and Geralti the older species pair, and then Geralti and Longicornis the younger species pair. Geographically, uh, Vitropenis lives throughout North America and is sympatrically in, uh, interacting with Longicornis on the west coast and Geralti on the east coast. We have thousands of molecular markers. We have full genome sequences. Uh, we've developed germ-free rearing. These are easily maintained. All right, so you might be wondering what's going on with these wasps. So the male does a courtship display where he nods his head, spits pheromones at the female's antenna, sweeps his antenna, all trying to stimulate receptivity. Once she's receptive, her antenna goes down, um, her abdomen opens up, the male will back up for insemination, just takes a couple seconds, uh, and there'll be a sort of uh, recycle of, these imagery, of this imagery for a little bit. The male does have to actually say goodbye so that she'll use his sperm. There'll be a post-copulatory display where the male gets back on top, does some more pheromone spitting and head nods, and then the mating event is done. The female will never mate again after this point. All right. You guys good with the video? Okay. All right. Yeah, it's a, I appreciate the point. It's a little X-rated, isn't it? Um, so this is a cheater male, actually, who's waiting for the opportunity once she becomes receptive to sneak attack, essentially, while this male's doing all the work. So these are pretty smart, smart individuals. And this one is going to bat away this one with its wings, just slapping it down. Interesting behavior. Okay, so the first symbiont we study with regards to speciation is Wolbachia. And this is, in fact, an embryo uh, stained for blue, the DNA of Nisonia, and then green for Wolbachia, which is an obligate intracellular bacteria. It's inherited maternally from mother's ovaries into the eggs. Um, and this egg is just caught freshly after it's laid, essentially. We stain it, and you can see this Wolbachia population in the posterior end of the embryo. Why the posterior end of the embryo? Well, these cells become the reproductive tissue cells of the next generation, the gonads, ovaries, and testes. So as early on as in embryonic development, Wolbachia figured out a way to specialize in the cells that transmit them to the next generation because this is maternally transmitted. Uh, in the testes, Wolbachia are, are labeled in red here. And then this is an electron microscopy image of the testes. And you see a whole bunch of pinwheel structures, which are the cross sections right through the tails of the sperm, that's what those would look like. And if you zoom in a little bit beyond that wider scope imagery, you will end up finding Wolbachia. And Wolbachia are not only interesting for being symbionts of the reproductive tissues, but there are also things that parasitize Wolbachia. So there's an entire bacteriophage explosion happening in this Wolbachia cell. There's about 60 phage particles blown up here, which have standard structures of icosahedral heads and little tails as well. That's a whole other story that our lab works on, so I won't spend any further time on that. Okay. Speciation. So we have three species that we traditionally study in regards to looking at reproductive isolation and the role of microbes in that process. And Wolbachia is an interesting story because each species has two different Wolbachia types. These types are called A and B, and they, they diverged about 60 million years ago. So they're very ancient strains of Wolbachia. There have been multiple acquisitions into each species. So this has an A infection and a B infection specific to Vitropenis. This has an A infection and B infection specific to Geralti, and so forth. There's one example where it appears there's been a co-divergence event, where an ancestral B Wolbachia infection co-diverged with the speciation event of Longicornis and Geraldi <laughs> to produce two fairly closely related strains of B. Wolbachia between these two species. So where does the reproductive isolation come into this? Where does the speciation story come in? 
Well, Wolbachia are famous for causing a sperm egg incompatibility called cytoplasmic incompatibility, or CI for short. Wolbachia live in the gonads. So in the testes, you've got them labeled in green. Uh, in the embryo, you've got them labeled in green as well. And they're doing modifications to the sperm and egg that ultimately affect compatibility. Because when you mate an infected male to an uninfected female, that gives an incompatible cross. No offspring or very few offspring are produced. Now, all other crosses are compatible. So what this indicates is there's a modification by the Wolbachia in the male to the sperm specifically that when the sperm fertilize an egg that's uninfected, this results in inviability of the embryo. And what's fascinating is that the infected female can actually rescue that modification of the sperm and that can lead to compatibility. Right? Why does Wolbachia cause this? Why would it do this? It's a maternally inherited infection. So if you look at the dynamics here, two-thirds of the offspring will be Wolbachia infected in this generation. But in the parental generation, the infection frequency is 50%. So it goes from 50% to 66% just by reducing the fitness of uninfected females. So therefore, no uninfected offspring are being produced. Now, every generation, you're going to have these dynamics. Essentially, the infection ratchets itself to fixation because it's continually reducing the fitness of uninfected females. Cytologically, it looks like this. So these are the male and female genomes in the first mitosis of a fertilized egg undergoing cytoplasmic incompatibility. And the major cytological change that's observed is the male chromatin doesn't condense properly and the female chromatin does to go through mitosis. Now, these chromosomes have to condense to go through mitosis. Here in metaphase, close to metaphase, the paternal chromatin is just diffuse and hasn't condensed. And ultimately, this leads to chrom paternal chromatin bridging during telophase. So the two cells are trying to divide, but the paternal chromatin just gets shredded in the process, and that leads to a dead embryo. One final point about Wolbachia and crossing incompatibilities. There's a second layer here called bidirectional CI. So if a male and a female have different strains of Wolbachia, they will be reciprocally incompatible. Uh, however, both will obviously rescue their own self-crosses. Now you can imagine a situation where you have two populations who only have different Wolbachia infections, and when they come back into contact, they can't interbreed because of this bidirectional cytoplasmic incompatibility. The implications are that you do not need genetic divergence to get reproductive isolation. All you would need are different symbiont infections that cause this sperm egg incompatibility to make a good species under the biological species concept. Is there any evidence for that? So in Nisonia, we've looked at this, and uh, what you're looking at here is the older species pair and the younger species pair. And we do the intraspecific and interspecific crosses. And the blue arrows show that when the parents are Wolbachia infected, you get almost no hybrids in the older species pair and just a few hybrids in the younger species pair. So a dramatic reduction, a major F1 reproductive isolation barrier because we're not getting hybrids between Wolbachia infected uh, parents from different species. And then when you do the same crosses, when they're antibiotically cured of their Wolbachia, all of a sudden the hybrid production comes way back, right? So we've essentially made good species not species anymore because they can interbreed. And it's solely due to their Wolbachia infections. In some cases, the amount of hybrids actually goes higher than the parentals. <laughs> all right. So this indicates that both the older and younger species pair have different Wolbachia infections, which contribute to a major F1 reproductive isolation barrier. And if you look at other types of reproductive isolation barriers, in addition to cytoplasmic incompatibility, what you find in both the F1 and the F2 generation is the older species pair has a lot more reproductive isolation than the younger species pair. Just as we'd expect from that coin and or chart where genetic divergence correlates with the amount of reproductive isolation, in this case, the older species pair has more genetic divergence, so more types of reproductive isolation. And if you put this on a chart, it would look something like this. So genetic divergence plotted against reproductive isolation. There should be some kind of correlation that's positive that goes from 0 to 1, where 1 is complete species status. 
The older species pair is going to sit somewhere up here. These are good species. Wolbachia cause lots of isolation, and there's many other reproductive isolation traits in the F1 and F2. The younger species pair, however, is going to sit somewhere about right here. There isn't a lot of reproductive isolation. There isn't a lot of genetic divergence. And the effect of the Wolbachia symbionts is to push the species status to completion by just acquiring these different Wolbachia infections, which Nisonia appears to be very good at. Okay? So that's story one. It's a little bit of an old story. I want to uh, tell you a little bit about how we're thinking beyond just Wolbachia. Now, Wolbachia occur in 40% of all arthropod species. So this is not a rare microbe. It's probably not causing speciation in just one type of system. Um, but the more yeah. general thing I'd like to consider is the gut microbiota, because every animal does have a gut microbiota. Wolbachia mostly live in arthropods, and arthropods do comprise a large fraction of animal species. But of course, not all arthropods have Wolbachia, um, and not all animals have Wolbachia. So can we broaden ideas about speciation in light of microbes through the gut microbiome? In, in a very general sweep here, I think we can think about the question of what guides the formation of the gut microbiota in animals in two ways, right? It's very well appreciated that diet affects the type of microbiome that are in our guts and also in many model systems. And it's also appreciated that our host genetics can affect the structure and composition of the microbiota. In this paper by Sharon et al. in 2010, it actually showed an instance of laboratory reproductive isolation, but it took a single Drosophila melanogaster, reared on two different types of media for several generations, so the same Drosophila melanogaster strain, and then asked, do those two types of Drosophila melanogaster mate with each other? And in fact, there's reduced mating between melanogaster from different media. And they were able to show that, in fact, the gut microbiota had changed substantially on the two different media. And in fact, if you cure the gut microbiota, you can rescue this mate discrimination that had been derived from the rearing on two different media. And you can move microbes back and forth between the two types of media, ones that are microbes that are specific to a particular media, and actually change the mate discrimination. So the gut microbiota here was shaping mating behavior and preventing one strain of Drosophila melanogaster from mating with the other strain. And then there's this uh, study, pioneering study done by John Rawls, which, you know, they transplanted uh, microbiota from zebrafish and mice into each other, and ultimately showed that the host background, the mouse, when it receives a zebrafish microbiota, will actually retool that zebrafish microbiota to somewhat of a mouse-like microbiota, and vice versa which indicates that the host also, besides diet, also has a role in structuring the gut microbiota. Now, we're really interested in the host by microbiome interactions. And one way we think about this is it could be possible that there's no correlation between microbiota similarity or microbiome similarity and nuclear genetic similarity. You sort of have this stochastic smattering. You can't make a solid prediction about if two species or two strains are a certain amount genetically different, that should then lead to some prediction about how different their gut microbiota is. In contrast, you could have a very deterministic model where the amount of genetic divergence in the host background should predict the amount of microbiome divergence or similarity. So you could consider this somewhat of a neutral theory of ecology where the microbiome just doesn't matter with respect to host genetics and performs the same function in all different backgrounds. Here, you might expect some kind of ecological selection happening where host background is essentially the selective pressure exerted on the microbiome structure, and it can happen in a predictable way. If that is true, you'll end up with a test where you can look for something we call phylosymbiosis, where the phylogeny of the host nuclear genome, or mitochondria, parallels the dendrogram relationships of the microbial communities. Now, this is not co-speciation or co-adaptation, right? This is the ecological metric for community relationships, whole communities, compared to the phylogenetic history of the host. In other words, species one and two might share 90% of their microbes in the gut, and species one and four might only share 50% of their microbes. And there may be hundreds of microbes that we're proxying in this kind of analysis. Uh, this is not coevolution by any stretch of the means. It's just simply parallel uh, 
trees in this case. And the model really works when we do this in diet controlled studies. Because we don't want to have any dietary variation impacting the structure of the microbiota under these two models. What we're really testing here is the microbiota is environmentally acquired when an animal is born, and that genetic differences in the host background will acquire different microbiotas uh, because of their host genetic variation. You can think about this pattern of phylosymbiosis as being analogous to phylogenomics in the sense that we're taking total 16S microbiota information and asking, do those relationships recapitulate the phylogeny of the host? Um, and also, we can generate statistics for doing tree comparisons. Okay, so how does phylosymbiosis get established? This is a very simple model where you can think of an ancestral population, which has a microbiome and a genome, that diverges over time. And there'll be divergence in both the genome and the microbiome. At some point, reproductive isolation might establish itself, and good speciation is complete when there's complete reproductive isolation. So now we have two good species that differ in their genetics and in their microbiota. Now, phylosymbiosis can get established horizontally, where microbes come in environmentally every generation into relatively sterile or germ-free organisms. So this species accumulates a certain microbiota environmentally, and this species accumulates a microbiota that's slightly different. That's one way in which you could predict phylosymbiosis could assemble itself. And in fact, there's a term for this in the ecology field called community heritability. This has mostly been looked at through the lens of trees that recruit arthropods uh, in specific ways, where tree genetic variation affects the type of arthropods that colonize them. And all we're doing is extending that here to host and microbe interactions, where host genetic variation affects the type of microbes that get acquired horizontally. Another way you could think about this is vertical transmission, right? And we do not know the relative extent of horizontal transmission that sets up phylosymbiosis versus vertical transmission, which could also happen. Okay. We have published a little bit of uh, work on thinking about how maternal transmission might occur more widely uh, in the animal world, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. So in looking at phylosymbiosis, um, we've been taking a comprehensive approach by diagnosing several different types of animals, all of which were reared in the lab, all of which have several different species within these uh, genera of animals that we've selected, except for the hominids. The hominids, we've taken an external data set derived from wild hominids published in Floss Biology. But we are now looking at Paramiscus reared in the lab, several different species, Drosophila reared in the lab in the same different species of Drosophila, mosquitoes, and Nisonia. And right off the bat, you can see that there's a degree of specificity here where the mammalian lineages tend to have a lot of similar bacterial community structure than the insects do, right? So the insects tend to be dominated by proteobacteria, which are labeled in orange, and the mammalian species tend to be dominated by Firmicutes and Bacteroides, which is well known. If you haven't seen these charts before, what we're just looking at is the total microbial diversity scaled from zero to one, uh, and the relative uh, size of the bar indi indicates the abundance, and the color of the bar indicates the type of bacteria we're looking at. So is this structured in any way? So you can start to look at the data globally and ask, well, is this, are these bacterial communities within each genus, are they just randomly distributed or do they group out into specific clusters? And when we do a principal component analysis of each of these microbiotas, they cluster strongly together. And when we do a network analysis where we're looking for key taxonomic differences that differentiate these communities, we again find clustering. And in both cases, principal component and the network analysis the mammalian lineages tend to have a lot of Firmicutes and Bacteroides that makes them clustered together, whereas the insects tend to have a lot of proteobacteria that makes them clustered together. A second prediction of phylosymbiosis is asking, is intraspecific, sorry for the misspelling there, intraspecific microbiota variation less than interspecific microbiota variation? Right? If the host has a lot of control or has an influence over what microbes colonize it, then intraspecies microbiota variation should be less than intraspecific microbiota variation. And for each system that we've looked at, uh, that, that is the case. Uh, there can be a lot of variation across these species. We've used a 99% OTU cutoff for this, so there is a lot of variation. 
but in each case, the intraspecific variation is less than the interspecific. Now we're looking at uh, principal component analyses of each individual animal clade, and the dots represent the individual species within that clade that we analyzed. So we're asking, is there specific community clustering of samples from the same species? And we're showing multiple species within that animal clade. And you can sort of visually see the segregation. These colors don't significantly overlap. In fact, they only overlap in the species pair from the Sonia, which is one of our model systems. And what's interesting is, is that this species, this clade of animal, you know, are very young species. They diverged 400,000 to a million years ago. Whereas all these other species have much higher divergence ranges, ranging from 8 million to 10 million years ago. So there appears to be somewhat of a correlation of microbiota structuring with age of divergence between these animal clades. And we can put that graphically on a chart like this, which essentially is measuring the R-squared value, that is the separation of microbial communities into different host species, across estimates of divergence time. And there's a very strong correlation with mosquitoes having the most divergence time also having the highest uh, R-squared value and Nasonia having the least, but still having a significant level of community clustering within host species. Nasonia is uh, what I'll spend the rest of the time talking on. This is a cross-section of uh, the abdomen of Nasonia, and we've stained for proteobacteria in green, which is the dominant microbe in Nasonia, and they tend to localize in the hindgut, at least in the adult stages. Uh, proteobacteria, as I've mentioned already, are common in insects, so Nasonia has a whole bunch of it. Uh, it's also very common in Drosophila and Apis honeybees. This would contrast to other, mam other mammalian animals, which have lots of Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. So when we take microbial communities from each of the three species, and we actually take those microbial communities at different developmental stages, what we find is a pattern of phylosymbiosis that curiously is developmentally staged, such that the pupae show a phylosymbiotic pattern. Geralta and Longicornis, more closely related, have more similar microbial communities than Tevitra penis. And the adults have their own phylosymbiotic microbial community, slightly different from the pupae. All right? When you see phylosymbiosis, you can say, well, that's an interesting pattern. There appears to be covariance between genetics and the microbiome structure, but is it functional? Does it matter to the organism? So one way to test that is to start doing microbial transplants, where we combine different genetic backgrounds with different microbiotas and ask, is there a reduction in fitness when you start swapping microbes from one species into the background of another, or at least a reduction in performance? And the way we've started to measure this in the lab initially is through larval development, because we have a germ-free rearing system or we can inoculate larvae with different microbial communities that are either interspecific or intraspecific. So what you're looking at here on the x-axis is time from larval days two to seven, germ-free, which have no microbes, vitropenous microbiota put into a vitropenous background in blue, and then a Giraldi microbiota put into a vitropenous background in green. And we have significant delays in growth in days two, days two through five. And that can just be visually shown here. Here's a germ-free day four. The size of the larvae is a lot smaller than vitropenous microbes going back into vitropenous. And when you take an interspecific microbiota or heterologous microbiota, the larvae are a little bit smaller as well than the normal match of uh, resident species to host and we see this in uh, not only viable bacteria in that previous slide, but in heat-killed bacteria. It actually appears irrelevant whether they're alive or dead. You can still recapitulate that same developmental delay. And finally, pupation rate is also affected. So here we're measuring the rate of larva uh, to pupation. This is a video that shows pupation as it's happening. And now we're in days 9 to 16 as these larvae are going through pupation. And the interspecific pupation, the heterologous microbiota put into a vitropenous background, is a bit slower than the blue uh, intraspecific microbiota going into the same genetic background. This is not uncommon, right? So when, you, when people have done this with much wider different microbial communities, 
they also find similar effects. Now, this would be a dramatic case of putting human microbiota into mouse versus mouse microbiota into mouse. And when you do that, the human microbiota in mice has a, leads to a global immunodeficiency, just like germ-free mice. So the human microbiome, even though it's a mammalian-like microbiome, does not confer any greater performance than the germ-free microbiota and the germ-free mice themselves. Also, the mice colonized with human microbiota are more susceptible to bacterial infections. So this matters at various scales. Uh, it may be more severe when you cross-pollinate very different species of microbiota between each other, like a human mouse. It may be less severe or less significant when you're getting too close to related species. That almost gives a prediction of this. All right. There's phylosymbiosis in the larval stages as well. And this is going to lead us into a, a second story about speciation in the Sonia. What I want to draw your attention to are the three primary species. So Vitropenis larvae, Geraltai larvae, and uh, Longicornis larvae. So we see that the Longicornis and Geraltai microbiomes are more closely related, more similar to each other than they are to the Vitropenis microbiome. And the reason is, is that the Vitropenis microbiome has a lot more unique species than the Geraltai and Longicornis microbiome do. The younger species pair is shown here. So Geraltai microbiota, Longicornis microbiota, and when you make a hybrid larvae, a hybrid larvae between Longicornis and Geraltai strikingly looks a lot like one of the parents. It almost looks like there's some kind of paternal priming or a dominant genetic effect of one species background on the hybrid larvae because it looks a lot like it. Now when you do this comparison with the older species pair, Vitropenis and Geraltai, the microbiota of these larvae looks fundamentally different from the parents, and in fact, a little bit more like this Longicornis Geraltai stuffing in that field. And what's interesting is that these larvae die at about a 90% rate. This is a hybrid breakdown that leads to death, and that death correlates with a different microbial community than what's in the parents. So this led to us thinking about speciation through the effects of the gut microbiota on these larvae. And what's happening in these crosses is we take a vitropenis male and a Geraltai female, we make them mate, they produce F1 hybrid females in the absence of the Wapia, so now they produce these F1 hybrids. We let the F2 hybrid males develop. These are haploid males, so they express all recessive incompatibility factors. What we end up with is this hybrid breakdown. And the data looks like this. The parental larvae have a consistent number of have a consistent development. So they lay about 30 to 40 eggs, and about 30 to 40 adults come out. The hybrid larvae, however, in both cross directions between Vitropenis and Geraltai, suffer from about 80 to 90 percent mortality. And that mortality occurs in the L1 to L4 phase. So just between early larvae and late larvae. What's interesting is that for 10 years or more, the field of Nusonia biologists has been studying this trait through the lens of trying to find the host genes that affect the hybrid and viability, essentially find the speciation gene. And those QTL analyses have mapped genetic regions to four chromosomes that associate with hybrid and viability. So we started to put some of the data together, and because the hybrid larvae is different, we started to think about whether the microbiome itself is perhaps assisting the reproductive isolation of hybrid death. Whereas in the control cross of the younger species pair, we do not see any death, and we see a microbiome like one of the parents. So the, the low-hanging fruit here was, these are our four expectations. Conventionally reared hybrid will die. A germ-free hybrid, if the microbiome assists the mortality, will live. And then if we put bacteria back into the germ-free hybrid, that hybrid will also die. So these two will die, and these two will live. We had to generate a germ-free rearing system for this when we first started the work. And essentially what that involves is moving these little tiny eggs that a Nasonia mother will lay, put them onto a transwell plate, and those eggs are sitting on a filter, and the filter sits on a meniscus layer of fly hemolymph that is sterile. And so these eggs now will mature into larvae, the larvae will feed on that hemolymph and develop into good larvae. Pupae. So when you do this type of analysis, the conventional uh, hybrid mortality is quite strong. It 
already alluded to. When you do it with germ-free rearing, the hybrid viability shoots up dramatically. Um, so just by bringing the hybrids into a germ-free state, we no longer see any of this significant hybrid mortality. And the real punchline was, can you reinstate hybrid lethality in these germ-free organisms, sort of in a, 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 a knock-in experiment of the microbiome? Here we've knocked it out. We don't get the mortality. That's not in the microbiome. And we do recapitulate a significant amount of the hybrid mortality. Now, this is all gut-mediated hybrid mortality, not Wolbachia-mediated, right? So we have two levels of isolation now that cause different kinds of inviability in the Sonia. Moreover, we thought it would be interesting to look at whether the QTLs that had been identified in the Nasonia genome disappear when you rescue the viability of these hybrids, right? Because those QTLs should no longer be significant factors since there's no viability. In other words, the way the QTL analysis works is it looks for marker ratio distortions in alleles. If there were no hybrid invi inviability alleles, all markers would be inherited at an alien ratio of 50% from either parent in the recombinant hybrids. But in a case where you get inviability, some alleles preferentially get recovered in the hybrids versus others. And in fact, that's what we see when there's hybrid mortality. Um, in these two categories, there are vitropenous alleles from the QTL regions that show deviations from 50%, deviations from Mendelian ratios. But under germ-free rearing, we restore those ratios roughly back to their Mendelian expected ratios. So the identification of QTLs for speciation genes is dependent upon whether the microbiota is present or not. Clearly, there's a host by microbiota interaction that is causing this hybrid viability. So what are those alleles? And what are those genes? So we don't have a firm answer yet, but we are using transcriptomes to look for candidate genes around those QTL regions. And right now, the smoking gun misexpressed genes in the genome that associate with death versus non-death are these SP genes. And the SP stand for serine proteases. And serine proteases are interesting from the phenotype perspective of this hybrid mortality because serine proteases sit above the signaling cascade that eventually turns on propanol oxidase on melanin. This hybrid mortality is a hypermelanization response. That darkening pigment is melanin. And insects and arthropods secrete melanin in capsid conflicts. So in the hybrids, the gut microbiome goes wrong. The immune system launches to attack that gut microbiome. And it appears that the misexpressed genes in those hybrid larvae associate with the types of genes we might expect involved in melanin production. So we're in the process of knocking these genes down and ultimately figure out if they are causal to the phenotype. All right, so two stories here. Um, one is with Wolbachia on the right, and one is with the gut <laughs> microbiota and phylosymbiosis. And in both cases, we see the bacterial symbionts contributing to strong degrees of reproductive isolation in very closely related species. And one thing that I like to ask is, have we just gotten really lucky in looking at a Nasonia parasitic wasp in which symbionts appear to be important to the speciation process? Or is it that we've just kind of asked the question with antibiotic experiments? And the more systems that come on board looking at reproductive isolation and the removal of bacteria through germ-free experiments or antibiotics might uncover a much wider degree of microbial-assisted speciation and reproductive isolation than we have thus far appreciated. There's reasons to be optimistic. So, as I mentioned in Drosophila, they're the gut bacteria change and affect mate discrimination. P. aphids would not live off of their plant sap diet without symbionts that confer essential amino acids that are missing in the plant sap diet. It's possible these kinds of nutritional symbioses uh, allow new species to colonize uh, various niches that they couldn't before. There are many studies that map immune genes to speciation genes. This is a study within Arabidopsis done by Kirsten Bombley's lab at Harvard. Just took Arabidopsis strains and found this hybrid necrosis phenotype in the F1 generation. And these are very small hybrids, obviously, and they are poor performers. And the genetics, in fact, map to these immune genes, these NBLLR genes. 
one thing I like to think about is that immune genes, although mapped to chromosomes, are still windows likely into speciation. Because these immune genes didn't diverge in a vacuum, they likely diverged in response to changing pressures from the microbiome. And even in humans, if you look at the most rapidly evolving genes and the genes under the most adaptive evolution, there's huge amounts of immune genes that are fitting into those categories. So over and over, when we look at evolution within genomes, whether it's humans, flies, or plants, the immune genes tend to be the most rapidly evolving. So there probably is a lot of crosstalk between microbes and the host immune system that lead to reproductive isolation events, some of which we will have yet to uncover. Here's a study done by John Janicki's lab at the University of Rochester in natural populations where they took Drosophila resins, or actually they measured Drosophila resins in the wild, which have Wolbachia, and Drosophila subquinaria, closely related species. And they meet in a hybrid zone uh, uh, just at the border of the United States and America, or sorry, United States and Canada. And there's various types of reproductive isolation that occur between these two species in the hybrid zone, one of which is Wolbachia induced unidirectional CI, when coupled with these other things, dramatically reduces gene flow. So this is almost a combinatorial type way to get to speciation through microbes and genetics. Asexuality is commonly induced by Wolbachia symbionts and other types of bacteria. Uh, in many cases in parasitic wasps, where the parasitic wasp, once sexual, become asexual. And the bacteria are, in fact, assisting that. The bacteria make them asexual. It's not something I'm going to get into the details in. But the consequence of that is that the bacteria could be facilitating speciation of the asexual lineages from the sexual. So what I want you to think about is, let's say you have a species of parasitic wasp. One's infected and it's asexual. One is uninfected and sexual. The asexual lineage um, has essentially no need to mate anymore. Right? There's, no, there's no pressure for males to perform behaviors. There's no pressure for females to perform sexual behaviors. It's all asexual. But the uninfected population that's still sexual is still experiencing bouts of sexual selection, which could change the mating behaviors of the males and females, such that when these come back into contact, they can no longer mate with each other because the males have, let's say, evolved new traits that these asexual females can't recognize in the And that would completely seal off gene flow. Asexuality itself doesn't seal off gene flow because these females could still be sexual they made it to the male here. But if the sexual selection strategies change enough, then it could be a form of asexual speciation assisted by the parthenogenic bacteria. Um, and this is another model, which instead of the action or change happening in the uninfected sexual lineage, the changes happen in the asexual lineage, where there's mutation accumulation in male-specific or female-specific reproductive traits. And they can no longer mate with uh, males from How are we doing on time? Ten minutes? Okay, good. So uh, I want to just uh, reflect a little bit on uh, thinking about this question of what is a species made of. And clearly a species is made of a nuclear genome. And that nuclear genome is comprised of not just good behaving genes on autosomes, but all sorts of genes in conflict with those autosomal genes, cells genetic elements. And to some extent, the nuclear genome is uh, not a harmonious, vertically inherited portion of the species because recombination is obviously mixing up genetic variation every time they're set. I want to compare that kind of thinking to the microbiome. Whether the microbiome is analogous in concept to the nuclear genome and to what makes up a species. And the microbiome is obviously composed, composed of all sorts of different elements. We've talked a lot about the bacterial microbiome in this talk. And the major difference is that the microbiome is probably not vertically inherited to a large degree. Maybe some fraction, we don't actually know the extent of this yet. But we assume that the microbiome is mostly horizontally acquired every generation from the parents. And one reason for aligning the genome and the microbiome into what makes up a species is because if you do the math, the theory that 
uh, that looks at whether genes in the nuclear genome can remain stable with each other over sexual reproduction or recombination. That map, because recombination disrupts genes hanging out together in the vertically entire genome, that map can be extended to host microbe associations with horizontal transmission. In other words, horizontal transmission is a disruptive force to maintaining hosts and microbes together, just like recombination is. In fact, uh, there's, there's a nice theory paper by um, Benjamin Fitzpatrick from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville that basically outlines, outlines these theoretical continuums between host microbe stability and gene-gene stability in the nuclear genome. It's an interesting uh, concept to think about in terms of aligning what is traditionally viewed as all of the stuff of Darwinian evolution and then all of the stuff of ecology. But rather there's this merger of both evolutionary processes and eco ecological processes that can be analyzed <laughs> under the same theory. Okay, so if you want to go a little further with this, and I'm, I'm going to be sticking my neck out a little bit, um, I, I want to draw upon this quote from Peter and Rosemary Grant, which is that nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of ecology. And the reason I think that's relevant here is because it's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about post-evolution in light of the microbiome. And there are some new terms that have been thrown around to describe what these structural entities are. But the host and microbial community can be called a holobiont. Holo for the entire assemblage of species, uh, biont for organisms or species that. So all the species that comprise what is traditionally thought of as an individual. And therefore, the genomes of the holobiont, the genome and the microbiome, would just be called the hologenome. This is a very controversial area. It's, it's sort of in debate right now. Uh, one of the reasons I like the terms holobiont and hologenome is because they replace misnomers like organ system for the microbiome or superorganism for these assemblages. Superorganism is a better term for eusocial colonies of the same species interacting with each other. Here we've got host and microbial species often diverse interacting with each other. We need a better name for that. And the holobiont is one that people, many people are considering and debating. This is not some sort of happy kumbaya though. And I think people uh, tend to think that when they first hear about this. And that is, if you think about it, there's all sorts of cooperation and conflict happening within the entity of the holobiont. Genes are in conflict with each other. Genes are in conflict with organelles such as cytoplasmic material. And also, microbes, if you include them as part of the species or the individual, are potentially in cooperation or conflict with each other, as well as the host genetics. And all of this together is what really forms the link between genotype and phenotype of the so-called individual animal or plant. And the hologenome, therefore, is the genomic material of the entire assemblage which is separate from the environmental metagenome. The metagenome term was, in fact, originally coined for soil uh, microbial genomes. It had nothing to do with organismality or individuality or uh, host traits. So the distinguishing feature here is host-associated material falls into the holo category. The stuff in the soil, the community, microbial community stuff, falls into the meta-type terms. All right. One final point. Um, I like this quote from Simon Levin, who, uh, who is still at Princeton. He gave this uh, MacArthur Award lecture in 1992, and he said, it is argued that the problem of pattern and scale is the central problem in ecology, unifying population biology, and ecosystem science. There's this tension, obviously, here about whether one should combine population biology processes with ecosystems processes or community processes. On the one hand, we have very well-established uh, terminology for what is the sort of standard stuff of an individual. On the other hand, there are, there, are, there are ideas about how one could reformulate these in the light of the microbiome. So take, for example, individual selection versus community selection. Selection on the individual might be selection on the host genome or its, or its organelles. Select, community selection might be a term that best applies when selection is operating on phenotypes that are derived from both the host and microbial community. It's therefore a community trait rather than an individual trait. Um, you can similarly go down the list and think about analogs between things like gene flow. You could add in gene and microbe flow. We've talked about phylosymbiosis as a parallel to phylogeny. And ultimately, precision medicine is not going to boil down to just 
genome-wide association studies and mapping traits that underlie diseases, it's, it's going to have to underlie a, a sort of whole genome analysis where you include both microbes and the host genetics into what ultimately shapes the disease phenotype of an individual. Okay, with that, I will uh, thank uh, some of the people who co contributed in major ways to this work. Dr. Robert Brucker, a former graduate student and postdoc now at Harvard at the Roland Institute. Uh, several uh, uh, members of the lab. Lisa was a former graduate student, now postdoc, about ready to move on. Uh, Teddy, Andy, and Bill are our current graduate students. I also want to thank the National Science Foundation for funding, as well as Vanderbilt for funding. Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, if there's any time for questions here or later, I'd be happy to take them. So, thank you. Yes? couple of different answers for that. It's a great question. Uh, we originally showed that uh, when species live in sympatry, uh, when the Sony species live in sympatry, they tend to show greater mate discrimination between each other than when you find areas of allopatry. <laughs> so, for example, the vitropenna species, which lives all throughout North America, if you take sympatric isolates that live with Geralti or sympatric isolates that live with Londicornis, those show greater mate discrimination than the vitropenis geographic isolates that live in allopatry. So at least at a geographic natural population level, there appears to be some level of discrimination happening in sympatry. The second answer is what Dylan is actually currently working on, which is getting rid of the gut microbiome, making germ-free organisms, and asking do germ-free organisms mate in the same way than, than conventional organisms. And then when you do microbial transplants, can you start to swap the mating behaviors between the animals? And so that, that remains to be determined, but definitely we're on that. Anything else? Don't be bashful. So I'm going to flip the idea of species in the microbiome. Have you seen examples or heard examples where the microbiome promotes hybrid? So, so I'm thinking of blue mussels in the ocean, they have these um, really distinct hybridization zones, where you have two clear species that really well um, as hybrids, so if you touch me, uh, you make them stare out of their Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. I don't know of any natural case, so if, if you were on the hunt for that, you might actually have the, or if you know of a case, that would, might be the first one that would be worthy of experimentation. I guess you could imagine that in inbred populations, uh, perhaps both the genotype itself is inbred and accumulates genetic mutations, as well as the microbial community potentially shows some effect of inbreeding. So that when you make the hybrids, perhaps the hybrids have a more diverse genotype, but also a more diverse microbiome. And with diversity, we tend to think about healthy ecosystems, right? So I, I, I've never thought of that. I like that idea. Um, and those are my first thoughts on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of a tough question to answer because it would require that we sample everything everywhere at all times. Clearly, when you sample hosts, and not just in our work, in many people's work, those hosts tend to show a structure of the microbiome that's different from the environment in which they live. In. So they're refueling or getting colonized by specific microbes that aren't coming in the environment. And that host tend to differ in the microbes. So it doesn't rule out the theoretical possibility that you can switch in microbes you want. It's accepted. 
Yes, you do. Absolutely. Yep. So one of the big areas in the field is what is the genetic basis of that trait? Because it looks like the male Wolbachia have genes to cause this chromatin modification. And then the Wolbachia and the females, it's the same strain of Wolbachia. They're apparently doing the rescue of the of the of maternal chromatin in the fertilized embryo. So are they the same genes? Could it be the same genes in Wolbachia that do modification and rescue? Or are they different sets of genes that do modification and rescue? And is any of that mediated through the host? So there could be a, a, a host by microbe interaction that determines these traits rather than just a pure microbe interaction. Likely the host is involved because that paternal chromatin defect is due to a lack of histone recruitment into the paternal chromatins. So normally the chromatins will wind up by being wrapped around histones. And in this particular CI cross, the histones don't get re recruited to the chromatin. So Wolbachia is setting up something in which the host histones don't ever make it to the paternal genome. How? Not sure. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it.